You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. Welcome to this week's episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. And as normal, I'd like to begin with a shout out to all of our new listeners. And this week we have new listeners in London, Manchester, Birmingham, Newcastle upon Tyne, Ipswich, Dartford, Swansea, Cardiff, Portsmouth, Sheffield, Guildford, Leeds, Southampton, Reading, Havant, Eastleigh, and then we also have new listeners in Dublin, in Ireland, in Lille, and in Alsace, in France, in Lisbon, in Portugal, in Barcelona, in Spain, in Brabant, in Belgium, in The Hague and Rotterdam, in the Netherlands, in Berlin, in Germany, in Hoverstaden and Copenhagen, in Denmark, in Stockholm, in Sweden, in Sauerland, in Iceland, in Malopolsky, in Poland, Vienna, in Austria, Zagreb, in Croatia, Budapest, and Salznok, in Hungary, Serbia, Istanbul and Ankara, in Turkey, Casablanca, in Morocco, Kampala, in Uganda, Tamil Nadu, in India, Beijing, in China, Tokyo, in Japan, Brisbane, in Australia, the Bay of Plenty in New Zealand, and in uh, Canada we have British Columbia, Ontario, and Quebec, and then in the USA we have new listeners this week in Los Angeles, San Francisco, Denver, Boston, Grand Rapids, Washington DC, Austin, Rochester, Jacksonville, Pittsburgh, Chicago, Hartford, Monterey, Orlando, Memphis, New York, Milwaukee, Seattle, Pasco, Philadelphia, and Cincinnati. So once again, a wide range of listeners right around the globe. Warm welcome to all of you, and of course a warm welcome to all my returning listeners, all my regular listeners. I really appreciate you taking half an hour out of your week to catch up with me with the latest news with GDPR. And I hope you find the programme interesting and informative and entertaining. And, of course, if you ever have any feedback on the show, or you have ideas for new features, or you have ideas for people you'd like me to interview on the show, then please do always just drop me a line at podcasts at insurability.co.uk, or go to our podcast page on our website on www.insurability.co.uk, that's E-N-S-U-R-E-T-Y dot co dot U-K. Or you can now also find our podcast on the uh, podcast page of our GDPR training course website at gdprtrainingcourse.co.uk. And so, uh, great to have you all along. Really excited this week because last week, this episode, actually reached number 53 in the Business News Apple iTunes chart. Uh, for the UK, which I'm really, really pleased with. First time we've got into the uh, position 53 in the chart. And obviously it'd be great to get into the top 50 or even the top 40. So if you listen to the programme and you enjoy what we have to say and you find it useful and informative, please do tell your friends, do tell your colleagues and get them to tune in too because the more people we get listening, the more great features that we can bring to you on the GDPR Weekly Show. So in a few moments, I'll be telling you what's coming up in this week's episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. Check us out on Facebook. So coming up in this week's episode of the GDPR Weekly Show, we look at the results from a survey conducted by Office Depot into how companies are handling physical paper documents and how that handling may or may not be GDPR compliant. And I think for any organisation which has got paper documents, which is probably... 99% 99% of the people listening to the podcast. This is one part of the podcast well worth listening to because it gives us some key points about handling physical paper documents. We then move on to look at a survey which has been compiled into consumer perceptions of GDPR. So looking at it from the consumer perspective rather than the business perspective. We then have news of a major data breach at Flipboard, which is an Android app, which if you have an Android phone, probably you've got Flipboard on your phone. So 
if you are an Android user, that's well worth a listen. And then we have a look at the results of another survey. It seems to be survey week this week, but the results of another survey which has come out that show that 50% of European top 100 websites still aren't GDPR compliant in one way or another. And we cover the reasons that sites aren't compliant in that article. And then finally, for this week's edition of GDPR Weekly Show, just as we're going to press, we have news of a data breach at the University of South Wales. So as always, quite a mixed bag of articles in this week's GDPR Weekly Show. We hope you find them useful, entertaining and informative. And as always, if you have any feedback, do let us know at podcastandsurety.co.uk. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. Office Depot, a major supplier of stationery and business equipment, released details of a survey which it conducted uh, this week. The survey spoke to more than 300 office workers across the UK and Ireland and asked some questions about GDPR and GDPR compliance. And although it found that the majority of those companies surveyed were reasonably compliant, there were still alarming levels of bad practice being adhered to, which causes putting companies and organisations at risk of a data breach and therefore at risk potentially of a fine. Um, Statistics from the survey revealed how one-fifth of UK companies, so 21% actually, still stored physical documents containing personal data either on or under their desks, i.e. the documents weren't being locked away at night, um, and also that the documents that course were on the desk could be viewed by somebody who didn't have authorization to view them, particularly if you had a visitor to the office. And this perhaps is a good time to remember that GDPR doesn't just apply to computer records. I know those of you who are regular listeners to the GDPR Weekly Show or those of you who are attending our training will know that I tend to harp on about this a bit, but it is really important that people understand that GDPR is not just electronic data, it's actually paper data too. It's actually about all the paper documents that you have in your office. So with your paper documents, just take extra care with them really. Don't have masses of papers laying on your desk or under your desk. Do lock away paperwork, especially when you're out of the office and especially overnight or at weekends. And make sure you have a filing cabinet or filing cabinets where the locks actually work. I've lost count of the number of offices that I've gone into whilst I've been conducting training on GDPR and found that there are filing cabinets with locks, but people have long since forgotten where the keys are, or the key is in the lock, but when you turn the key, nothing happens. And either of those, if they found during a um, data audit, an audit carried out by the ICO, would mean that you would fail and potentially leave yourself open to a financial penalty. So please do lock papers away in your fine cabinet or a steel cupboard, a secure cupboard, and do make sure the lock on the cabinet or the cupboard actually works. So coming back to this survey, the other thing that it looked at was how people disposed of physical data, how people disposed of paper documents. And they found, quite astonishingly really, by this video, is that 12% of people are still just disposing the documents by tearing them up by hand. And 34% are using a strip shredder, or what I tend to call a spaghetti shredder, the ones that just produce long streams of strips of paper. It's very important that you understand that a strip shredder, whilst it's better than no shredding at all or tearing up by hand is not GDPR compliant. It does not meet the requirements. If you have a strip shredder, it's time to consign it to the local waste recycling centre because what you need is a cross-cut shredder. And for next week, I will make sure that I have a page on our website 
tailing some suitable cross cut threaders so that you can go and have a look and choose one which hopefully will suit your needs but please do start looking at the idea of a cross cut threader the other likely cause of a data breach is someone stealing a laptop and this is another thing this survey discovered which i personally was not surprised by i suspect it's far far too common is that lots of businesses are still experiencing laptop theft yet only a half of businesses in the uk and ireland take any effort to provide laptop users with a lock to secure their assets now all laptops or pretty well all laptops have facility for something called the kingston lock and again, on the website for next week, I will make sure that there's some details of suitable Kingston locks that you can use to lock your laptop when it's on the desk to make sure that no one can just simply pick it up and walk away with it. Now, obviously, it only works if you've got somewhere to actually secure that lock too, but I'll talk more about that next week when I can show you some examples of locks that meet the uh, needs. I'd like to thank Office Depot for sight of their survey results so that we've been able to bring this information to you. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. There have been a number of articles this week in the press following the first year of GDPR. And indeed, as you know, the birthday of GDPR is something which we covered in the GDPR weekly show last week um, so blowing our own trumpet for a moment just so to say that sometimes we as a podcast can be ahead of print media which is a nice satisfying feeling but anyway back to the subject in hand there, there have been a number of articles about GDPR now being a year old some saying you know has it been the carrot before the stick some saying it's been the year 2000 problem all over again and there's a lot of hype but nothing's really happened i've got some sympathy with that view but i think it's an ill-informed view because the ico is actually dealing with an awful lot of data breaches and not necessarily by way of punishing companies but actually by way of education which actually i think is the best answer and so I don't think it's true to say that it's been carrot and no stick. There has been some stick, just maybe not quite the financial stick that some were aware of. And I was also a bit surprised to read an article in a respected journal this week, which mentioned the fact of um, fines and penalties being different across the EU. And they thought that the introduction of GDPR would not just standardise data protection across the EU but would actually standardise the fines and penalties and of course it hasn't uh, and I don't think any of us who work in the industry day in day out actually ever believed that it would. Um, certainly certain, some multinational companies are taking advantage of this, they are setting up an office in countries where the fines are less severe in the hope that they can then get that regulator to investigate any data breach rather than let's say the data the data regulator in france who we see nil cnil who we know are taking a hard line already evidenced by their multi-million fine on google against some other uh, former east european countries where the regime is probably not so strict and definitely not so strict in terms of the fines and penalties that they're imposing and indeed our own ICO here in the UK is greatly increased the level of fines that they have been imposed on companies but probably still aren't fining enough companies to have the maximum impact and I, I think that's something that the ICO in turn need to look at. But following on from that, um, one pulse have actually taken things the other way. And they've actually, for change, instead of surveying companies or organisations, they've surveyed members of the public and asked them about GDPR. And the results of their survey, and I give thanks to one pulse for giving us sight of their survey, 
But the results of their survey are interesting because one in five members of the public, so 20% of the public, felt that GDPR has been an anti-climax. But even more than that 20% did not really understand the impact it's had. And when they were asked specific questions, um, 34% said that they felt they were still getting as many intrusive ads when they were browsing the internet as they've ever done. So they weren't sure that GDPR had done anything for them. 32% said they didn't think that GDPR would make any difference to how Facebook behaves. 28%, and this perhaps was not a surprising figure amongst the public, 28% said they still don't really understand what GDPR is all about. 24% said they were concerned about how WhatsApp intended to use their data. And I think that's interesting that one in four there have picked an individual app out as being their main concern. 20% said it wasn't until GDPR that I realised how much data companies held about me. And I think that's probably a good thing that people are now more in the know on that. 20% said GDPR was an anti-climax. 18% said they'd never talked about GDPR outside of work. And so some interesting figures there from actual members of the public about their perception of GDPR, which perhaps is not the same as the perception that we have from companies, particularly larger companies and, and organisations. And there is a recognition, I think, on the company's organisation side that we all knew that GDPR would take a while to settle down and bed in. And indeed, you know, some of the legislation is still in the stage of being amended to cope with things which the proposed legislation has actually hit problems against when it comes into the real world. But coming back to members of the public for a moment, the survey also looked at how people felt about consent and 35% felt that companies were now asking for consent before storing any of my data and I think that's a worryingly low figure actually because I would hope that far more companies than that are actually asking for consent but that's the perception is in the public who were surveyed. 34% said 24%, I beg your pardon, 24% said that companies are clearer about what personal data they are storing. 20% said companies are now only sending me details that I've opted into. So that's a, that's a plus, but again, I would hope that figure would be higher. 17% said companies are requesting consent when they felt that they should. Uh, 13% said companies are not sharing their data without telling me. And again, that's quite a low figure, so it seems like perhaps people aren't being clear enough on data sharing or that people aren't putting it in terms that the public can understand. 13% said they believed that companies were being fined for not complying with GDPR, which is again interesting because if you talk within business, businesses say not enough of companies are being fined, and yet amongst the public, 13% think that lots are being fined. So, hmm, interesting perception. Perhaps it's only because the big fines actually make the news outside of the specialised media. And only 10% believe that companies were reporting data breaches within the necessary 72 hours. And mm, I sadly believe that I suspect that figure is pretty true. Um, because I think not enough companies now, lots of companies now, have procedures where they know what to do when there's a day breach. But probably not that many are reporting them. Against which I have to look at it from the other side and say that, of course, you, know, you have to have a degree of judgment on when to report a data breach to the ICO because not everyone needs to be reporting. It's important that you listening remember that. You don't need to report every data breach to the ICO. It depends on seriousness of the data breach, how many people, what data, how long, etc. But you must, absolute must, make sure that it's recorded in your data breach register. 
and if you don't have a data breach register or you're not sure what a data breach register is then please do get in touch with us via podcast at insurity.co.uk and we'll be pleased to give you some advice on setting up a data breach register within your organisation. The final stat to come out of the one poll survey was that 27% didn't believe that companies were doing anything to comply with GDPR at all. And again, that's one in four then who think, or just just over one in four, who think that companies aren't doing anything to comply with GDPR, but hope that that is a misconception. Um, but we shall see. And uh, if we get more consumer survey results, we'll bring them to you in future episodes of the GDPR Weekly Show. Check us out on Facebook. News aggregation site Flipboard, which has had something like 1 billion downloads of its app from Google Play and counting. So if you're an Android device, you almost certainly have Flipboard on your device. Has suffered a data breach. And the company say that they've now established that hackers gained access to data between the 2nd of June 2018 and the 23rd of March 2019 and in a further short window across the 21st and 22nd of April 2019. Flipboard at the moment say they're unclear how many users have had their data compromised. Data stolen includes names, Flipboard usernames, email addresses and hashed passwords. Now on the passwords, good news is that passwords on any Flipboard account created since 2012 were sorted and hashed using Bcrypt, which effectively makes the uh, password now pretty unusable by anyone who's stolen that data. However, if you had an account that was created before the 14th of March 2012, so you've been using Flipboard for over seven years, and you've not changed your password in that time, then your password probably hasn't been encrypted using Bcrypt, but instead using SHA-1, in which case it's much more vulnerable. But I'm really not sure how many users would have been using Flipboard for that length of time. However, Flipboard go on to say that as a precaution, they've reset all their users' passwords, even though passwords since 2012 were cryptographically protected and not all users' account information was involved. However, if you've got Flipboard on your smartphone and you you haven't actually killed the app, then you won't be asked for your password until you try and log in again. Um, So do look out for an email from Flipboard with your new password in it. Flipboard say they have something approaching 20 million active users and so if you use Flipboard it's probably a wise idea to change your password now anyway. The other thing with this data breach is that Flipboard since 2015 has been offering users the ability to register a new account quickly via either Google, Facebook and Twitter using single sign-on. The company, Flipboard, have said that the breach databases may have contained digital tokens used to connect your Flipboard account to your third-party account, either Google, Facebook or Twitter. As a precaution, we've replaced or deleted all digital tokens to eliminate any possibility of of misuse. The company does admit that in the period between when the data breach started and now, it has been possible that Others may have been able to read or make posts and messages on your account and access some user account permissions such as username, profile information, posts to the site and connections. In some cases, this access allowed changes to the information such as inviting new people to connect. However, Flipboard went on to say that the company had not detected abuse of these accounts, but the fact that these tokens have been refreshed means anyone using SSO We'll need to re authorise access via the account. So, again, it's just a case of logging out of Flipboard on your phone or device and logging back into it. It is perhaps concerning that 
this breach went undetected for the best part of 10 months. But, contrary to that, I would say that I'm really quite pleased with the way that Flipboard have responded to the data breach, their clarity of information and their speed of action since they discovered the breach. If we have any future update on the data breach from Flipboard, we will of course bring it to you in a future episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. We are getting an increasing number of our customers now already contacting us to arrange an audit as now it's coming up to towards a year from when GDPR came in and they want to make sure that they're operating as they should be and we'd like to offer this service out to all of you, all of our listeners. Uh, So if you'd like us to perform an audit on your GDPR uh, operations and make sure that you are recording everything you need to be, that you have all the necessary procedures in place and that you know how to action those procedures. Please do get in touch with us via podcasts at insurity.co.uk. That's podcast, P-O-D-C-A-S-T at insurity, E-N-S-U-R-E-T-Y dot co.uk. Please make the subject to your email GDPR audit and we'll get the relevant person to contact you. Um, We're able to carry out audits either on-site or remotely, and for a pleasantly low cost. Um, I'm sure you'll be pleasantly surprised with the figure we're able to provide you with for providing the audit. I can't give a global figure here because it does affect, it does depend on how many employees, how many customers, how many records, etc you have Um, but please do get in contact with us it's totally without obligation but do get in contact with us to arrange an audit because uh, if you do want the audit done around May or June of this year to be annual from when GDPR came in we are rapidly filling our diaries for that period so uh, don't delay do get in touch do it this week and we'll be pleased to provide you with a quote. And for the first five of you to contact us to request a a data audit, a data breach audit, I'm pleased to be able to say that we will provide that to you for 50% of our normal fee. But that's only for the first five of you to contact us as a result of this podcast. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. Online security company ImmuniWeb have been carrying out some testing of the 100 most visited websites in each of the 28 member states of the European Union. And as a result of that study, they found that the majority were either using non-compliant processes for GDPR or that their systems were insecure for hosting and managing user data. If we turn to the UK, out of the top 100 websites tested, 86 failed against this GDPR test for some reason or other. All 86 were found to be using third-party cookies to handle sensitive user information while 17% of the sites had either missing or hard to read or hard to reach privacy policies. On the plus side, all 100 of the most visited sites were now using HTTPS and had up to date uh, software on their site. The stats reveal that sites operating across the rest of Europe are more likely to be compliant with GDPR than sites in the UK, which is interesting. A study of popular sites in France found 83 of its top 100 were non-compliant. But then when we look at Germany, the number of non-compliant websites out of the top 100 falls to 50. So 50% of the websites there were non-compliant compared to 86% in the UK. However, across the different countries, the reasons for being non-compliant um, and notice to be different. 
because in France and Germany, the prime reason that sites failed wasn't the use of third-party cookies, but it was the use of either a hard-to-reach privacy policy or simply not having a privacy policy at all. And that applied to 50% of sites in France and 40% of sites in Germany. The CEO and founder of ImmuniWeb, Ilya Kalashenko, said, We can see laudable efforts aimed to improve web application security and adhere to GDPR requirements amid European companies. However, there is a long road before the majority of organisations value actual security above paper-based compliance, thereby providing their users with the privacy and security that they truly deserve. When we look at the survey, for the EU as a whole, 51.5% of sites had hard-to-understand privacy policies, and 78.25% showed insecure cookie usage, or the use of third-party cookies. As to be said, these are relatively alarming statistics, considering that GDPR is now a year old. So, there's obviously still work to do on GDPR, and I think that's true across the board. And obviously we're like trying to play our part in that. So if you feel that you'd benefit from some additional training in GDPR, then do of course get in touch with us via our email at podcast at insurity.co.uk or via our website at insurity.co.uk and one of our consultants will get back to you and arrange suitable training or support for your business, whether you're big or small. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. Some breaking news as we close this episode of the GDPR Weekly Show is that there has been a data breach at the University of South Wales. The university, which has campuses in Cardiff, Newport and Pontypris, and over 30,000 students, has taken down its student record system. The breach seems to have happened on Wednesday last week and one member of the university said that all staff accounts had had their passwords wiped. The university has called in the South Wales Police and we understand that the police have taken one person into custody and are currently questioning them about the data breach. However, it's important here that people remember everything you have to do because it's obviously good that South Wales University feel that they have um, found a relevant person or suspect and they are currently being dealt with by the police, which is why I'm being quite cautious about what I say. Um, but what they haven't done yet or what they haven't done as we close the press on this episode of GDPR Weekly Show is report the breach to the ICO, which is something that the university needs to do and needs to do within the 72-hour time frame. And again, this comes back to something we were talking about much earlier in this episode. We were talking about data breaches and when you need to report them to the ICO and when you don't. Given that the police are now involved in this case, I would think that it's very much a case that should be reported to the ICO and not simply recorded in the data breach register of the university. Doubtless there will be more news on this data breach next week, so we'll bring that to you in next week's edition of the GDPR Weekly Show. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. So that brings us to the end of this week's episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. I hope you found it useful. I hope you found it entertaining. Please do let me know. Let me have your feedback. By sending an email to podcast.insurity.co.uk. You can find out more about us and Insurity at www.insurity.co.uk. And I look forward to speaking to you again, same time, same place, next week. Have a good week, everybody, and remember to keep your data safe. Check us out on Facebook. The GDPR Weekly Show is an Insurity production. Follow us on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash insurity.